Hello, everybody. My name is Kenton DeYoung, and I'm sitting here with my co-host, Dylan Fairman. Hello. And this is Unsolved Canadian Mysteries. Wow. Tonight's broadcast is a true crime episode, and it features some disturbing true uh, cases that occurred in Regina. This particular... Wow. Uh, <laughs> and today's... And in particular... No, how should, geez, how do I word this? Let me think about this. <laughs> uh, okay. Warning. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Thank you. Warning! The stuff we're about to talk about is extremely messed up. If you do not have the capability of handling messed up things, you should turn this off because you will lose your goddamn mind. That was good. Okay. That was good. much better than mine. Okay, there you go. <laughs> okay, all right. Oh. So, Dylan, how are you? I am just well. How about you, Kenton? I'm doing great. Awesome. <laughs> I'm doing really good. That's awesome. Uh, so tonight, tonight and the next uh, three are going to be true crime. So we did four kind of paranormal horror and four true crime. We'll see what happens after that. Yeah, yeah. Then, 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 then we're gonna do uh, solved mysteries. Whoa! We actually got a lot of great feedback on the last really? one, and we got a lot of like uh, new followers too from Ooh. from uh, our new Twitter account or our new Instagram account. Ooh. Should check us out on both of those. But the numbers, the last one, people loved it. Good. Yeah. The numbers are up. They've they've been people have loved them. I've heard people say they've binged all four, so they're waiting for the next We're one. We're binge worthy. I guess so. Oh my I god! So. Wow. So tonight's broadcast, we're talking about an event that occurred in Saskatchewan between 1991 to 1993. Um, we weren't alive during that. I was born in 92. Wait, did you? What did you just say? 91 to 93. I wasn't born during that. <laughs> I thought you were. No, I'm a young boy. <laughs> okay, I was, I was born, born in 94. Okay, I was born in 92. Okay. I am a boy. I'm sorry. I promised you it happened in your lifetime, and I thought you were a little bit older. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> this event is known as the Martinsville Nightmare. It has an actual name because it was a investigation by the police. There was courts. There was charges. It... Uh, Spent it uh, several years, and it was one of Saskatchewan's most prominent criminal cases in the early 90s. <sighs> Have you ever heard of it? No. No. It wasn't until maybe three years ago I heard of it. I was really? like, where where was this been my entire life? Yeah, it seems like that would be right up your alley. Right, like it's it. So, <laughs> so Martinsville. If you have you know ever heard of Martinsville? Um, yes, but can you just you know let's just, let's explain it for all the people sure. who don't know. Yeah. So Martinsville is like this little community just north of Saskatoon. I had to stop in Martinsville once to get gas. Mm -hmm. uh, I was heading up to uh, the limestone crevices by Creton, and I took the wrong highway. I was supposed to go straight up to Prince Albert, but I went the highway to Saskatoon. Wow. I know. I really went the wrong way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like one is straight north and one you, is you, not. <laughs> yeah, you went the opposite direction. Yeah. And I realized that like an hour and a half outside the city. So I had to like either double back or just keep going. Oh. So uh, I got gas in Martinsville and then I trucked over to Prince Albert and then back over to uh, Creton, which is on the Manitoba border. So I thought you were going to say like you got in Martinsville and then there was this guy like just whittling a piece of wood and he was like, you ever heard of that? He told you about this story. No. Okay. Well, damn. Anyway. It looked like a nice little community uh, when I was there. Like how guess. many? How many? Uh, I'm not how many sure. streets would you uh, say roughly? I want to say the population is probably about two thousand people, oh, so wow. it's pretty okay. small. That might be off. I haven't looked into that actually. But I was telling my mom about this podcast, uh, this episode, because she was. I wasn't cognizant, cognizant enough at, in '92 to, to know. <laughs> really? No. <laughs> My mom was. So I asked, like, have you ever heard of Martinsville? And she said to me, some weird shit goes on there. Wow. So. Wow. My, my Straight mom from said, the mouth. <laughs> right from my mom. Wow. So that's what we're going into, the Martinsville nightmare of 1992. The story starts in about October. I don't have the exact date. That's okay. October 1991. Of course. Perfect time. for Perfect time for, for some crazy ass shit to happen. Yes. So a mother is coming, uh, mother's just came home from working in Saskatoon and she picked up her three children from the daycare and it's nighttime and she's washing them up and getting them ready for the bed. And uh, one of them is, is little, I think maybe two or three, we're still wearing a diaper. And uh, I think kids at three wear diapers. I don't know. Yeah, the stupid ones. <laughs> Someone's gonna tell us that's not right at all. <laughs> she's bathing this child and she notices the child has a very red uh, bum and some chafing. And, you know, it could be anything with a kid, right? Uh, it could be diaper rash, could be 
illness, could be anything, right? Right. So she asks the kid, did, did anyone touch you at daycare? And the child says, a stranger poked me in the bum with a pink rope. What? Yeah. Which in itself sounds terrible, but doesn't really make a lot of sense. Like, you poke with a pink rope? Unless the pink rope's a penis. Yeah. So the mother... <clears throat> contacts the police and says, like, my, my child has reported this. I'm wondering if you could look into it, All right? Is there anything here? It might just be nothing, right? Mm-hmm. So the police, there's a new constable on who just got hired. And actually, I have her name. Constable O'Grady. Constable Claudia Bryden. Claudia. Claudia Bryden. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Whew. So Claudia Bryden's fresh into the job and fresh this is like one of her first big police roles, right? And she's been handed this investigation. So she decides to interview and talk to the other parents who have children going to the daycare. Mm -hmm. See if anything else has been reported, right? So she calls up the children, calls up the parents and asks them, has anything happened at the daycare? Anything you want to talk about? And they all said, no, nothing's going on. Nothing's happening, right? So they ask the kids and still... Kids saying, no, nothing is going on. Nothing's happening at the daycare. It's perfectly fine, right? They all like it there. So that's kind of where the case stops. Like, okay, the one child has a rash on their bum, says they got poked with a pink rope, and that's the end of it, right? So Claudia starts digging into the files. And she finds, I should, I should call her Constable Bryden. I guess that makes more sense than Claudia. <laughs> I don't know. Claudia is a pretty name. Okay. We'll go Claudia. Okay. <laughs> so Claudia goes digging through the files to find out what... If there's any background information about this daycare, she finds finds out that like five, ten years prior, there was another report of a sexual assault at the daycare by the teenage son. So she decides to look into this further. And as she's kind of get, getting evidence, and this report was from a long time ago, it was never filed through. No one was ever charged. It was kind of like a, a statement made, okay. and that was the end of it. So as she's kind of getting information and looking into what happened to this case from 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 ten years ago. Uh, some of the parents start calling back and saying that the children have started saying that there's something going on at daycare. Now, this is where the story takes a very interesting turn because what the children are saying isn't your usual sexual assault of a minor kind of thing. They're saying that these children are being tortured. Tortured? Yes. They're saying they're being uh, sexually assaulted. They said they're getting uh, axe handles put up their, their, their rectums. What? They're saying that they're being forced uh, to perform sex on adults at gunpoint. A lot of very strange things coming from very young children. Okay. And this is a very small community. So this kind of stuff does not happen in Martinsville. So Claudia brings in a, a, a police officer from Saskatoon just to help handle this. Maybe some like someone who's a little more experienced in the field. And I'm not sure when the jump was made. I think it was because Claudia had gone to uh, several seminars or maybe it was uh, the opinion of someone from Saskatoon, but they thought there was some kind of, it wasn't like a, just the babysitter was involved. Like it was a larger group of people involved in this because the children said that there was more than just them. There was other adults, there other strangers they didn't know. This sounds super culty. Yes, that's exactly it. Oh no. So they began investigating and they determined that this group of people coming together and committing these crimes It is very cult-like, so much so that they think it might even be satanic. Because they're talking to the kids, they're interviewing the kids, and yeah, the the disturbing things of sexual assault come up, but so do things involving drinking blood and being cut and being hurt. So they ask the children, you know, they bring them in, they sit down, they talk to them in person, and the children start telling these stories that they are hauled in this this van, a white van with uh, black uh, paper on the windows, taken outside Martinsville to a blue shed. And in that shed, some of the children are put in, ca- put in cages. Some are put in the freezer, uh, locked in the freezer. Some are assaulted. There's also one that we talked about a waterbed, an instant having a waterbed. A lot of really horrible things. So they begin looking for this blue shed. Like, this is where the, like, the, all the children have identified this blue building. Let's find it, right? So there's a big hunt in the police department to find this building, and they locate it. Hmm. And they go to it, examine it, and yes, it has a cage in it. It has a freezer in it. It has a bed in it. It has an axe in it. But it's a chicken cage. It's a freezer full of meat. It's a normal woodcutting axe. 
Mm. It's, a, it's a regular bed. And there's no signs of, of blood or semen or any kind of or hair, anything that's the something terrible happened here, right? Right. And this happened over and over again. There would be something. Yeah. So they're interviewing the, the children, trying to get a better idea of who might have been. And this now has gone into 1992. It's been a few months now. And it's now going into Easter, into, I think it was um, May. So the police chief gets, because uh, he's now aware of this investigation. This has taken over the entire force. They're all looking into it. And the police chief gets a, a message, a tip, that this group of people, who they're still trying to identify the culprits of, are planning to kidnap and kill two of the children. And they're doing this in a form of like a satanic uh, invasion to come in and take the children. You said it's an anonymous tip was given yeah. to them? Yeah. So the police fear not only for the children who are apparently going to get kidnapped and killed, but for the families and for the churches, right? Because if a group of Satanists come into your city, your town, the churches are probably where they're going to go after. Mm -hmm. So the police chief tells everybody on the force to not only bring your regular license guns with you, but bring any gun you have and carry it in your vehicle. That they're going to have like a complete lockdown of the city that night. And anything that happens, they're going to put it down. Crazy. So they're, they're thinking there's going to be this satanic group that they, they, they report was there's going to be two busloads coming up from like Estevan area up to Martinsville to take these kids. So they sit there all night and wait. Nothing happens. The next night, they think, well, maybe they just got the day wrong, like right? 23rd, 24th, maybe. Nothing happens. The next night, nothing happens. But they don't understand how could such a tip, a very obvious tip, how could it be wrong, right? So as they're interviewing the kids, as Claudia's interviewing the kids, they start putting faces in front of them. You know, recognize this man, you recognize that man, right? And the children identify, besides the three people who work at the daycare, the mother, the father, and the son, six more. So a total of nine people. Yeah. Some of which are police officers. <gasps> oh my God. This is like, this is a movie. Like this is, oh my, what, what movie am I thinking of? Have you ever seen uh, The Wicker Man? No, I Where, like the whole town's in on it, and then uh, Nick Cage gets a bunch of bees poured on him. I've seen that part. The bees. So they think could someone have within the force be in part of this group and had told them not to come, mm. right? Because they know they would have been out armed, right. right? Obviously, makes sense. So then it's been now several months, six months or so, and there's no charges laid yet. So the police force begins to arrest people, charge them, and hold them, and begins the criminal process, right? So they arrest the three people who live, work the daycare. They also arrest some police officers, all of whom say they have absolutely nothing involved. They're not part of this. They're just trying to help the case. But there's, there's an issue with this case. There's not a whole lot of evidence. Mm. The, there's no evidence of any sexual assault at the daycare. The blue shack where these things apparently happened is perfectly fine. Um, everyone who's involved says we didn't do anything. The only evidence they have is the children. Right. And all throughout town, because this has gone on, people have people know what's happening now. They all have these signs in the windows that say, we believe the children. Because it's, it's the thought here is that children don't lie about stuff like right. this. Especially a bunch of them. It's not yeah. like all the kids got together and was like, hey, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> this is what we're going to do. It's not like the Rugrats are not planning to overthrow. Not even the Rugrats would lie about this. <laughs> you don't see Tommy and Chucky. Get... Anyway, I, I, those are the names I can remember. That, that's better than I can. Yeah. Tommy, Chucky, Phil, Lil, Angelica, Susie. Oh, Dee Dee's from Dexter's Lab. Right? Dee Dee. Yeah. But that's Dee Dee, not... what are you doing in my laboratory? <laughs> that's right. That's right. The, <clears throat> they began the criminal process to charge these people with these crimes against these children. But there's not much evidence. The prosecution's argument here is that if you're going to commit a crime with no evidence, the best person to have that to do that crime would be a police officer mm. they know what to look for they know where to hide things and know how right. to cover things up and they would have advanced information to clean things before the police get there so they begin this they begin the, the court the process and they do charge one woman with sexual assault of a minor but there's not a whole lot of information about her because she was only 18 at the time so there's no name there's no actual like i can find any details about her and then they also charge uh the son of the daycare with uh, the sexual assault case from 10 years prior. Right. Okay. But the parents determined there's not enough evidence to find them guilty. The daycare people who, who run the daycare. The okay. parents. So then they start looking into the police force. Do they have any evidence to find the members of the police force uh, guilty of this? 
They begin interviewing the police and trying to do the, the case against them to see what what is the defense, what's the, the claim, right? And, of course, any police officer who's been convicted of this, they are no longer on the force, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they they can't be. And, and with the police, especially if you've been charged with a crime, you are a criminal until otherwise. You know, usually it's, it would be you're innocent until proven guilty, but if you're on the police force, you're guilty until proven innocent. The first officer they bring in, he's the... Uh, I think he's. I think he's part of the uh, Saskatoon police. He was brought in. He was identified, and they had no evidence against him. So what they do is they bring in the kids to to look at faces. It's mm. been a few months, right? But look at faces and see like, are these people the same men or women that we are charging? So one child says, "Yes, that is the man. I recognize him. I can never forget that face. That's definitely the person." The other one says, "I think that might be him." And they say, "Can you look against? I'm sure that's him." And the other one says, "It's." Sorry, it's him, that guy with the tie. None of the people they identify are the people they're charging. They've picked the wrong people in this lineup. Hmm. So they bring in all these kids, they all pick the wrong people. So there's no evidence that this, there's nothing to say that this man was actually involved. The officer ever did it. He had any crimes, anything like that. And the, and the, and the kids who all the, were abused can't identify the abuser. The judge says, you are innocent. You're free to go. Your charges are all dropped because you've done nothing wrong. Doesn't, nothing. Okay, so, sorry. I'm, it's okay. Um... The kids identified people, but they couldn't. None of them like. I don't get it. Like, was there a, was there any one that was identified by all the kids? One specifically? No. no? Okay, so it was just like a clamor of shit. Yeah. They asked the kids like, "Why did you pick that one? Why did you pick that one?" And one of the kids said, "I picked him because I liked his tie." Oh, okay. Now I understand. That that is such a kid thing. Oh yeah. my god. You're like sending a man to jail, and then you're like, "Oh, I." Could you imagine? Me. Yes. Oh no. So the police, the first police officer is found not guilty and the charges are thrown out. Right. But there's still s- several more. So at this point, the government steps in and terminates the case because it, they say it's like an injustice. There's no evidence. There's nothing to claim these people did anything wrong. You're wasting time and money and there are, this, this is worthless. There's no point in continuing this case any further. Something does not happen very often that the government steps in and shuts things down. Interesting. So the people who were involved, the daycare is obviously shut down now. They have moved away, moved up to, I think, Prince Albert. The police officer, he was still a police officer for several years, and now he's gone, retired. But all these people who have were charged with these crimes and all found not guilty or had their charges taken away, their lives were completely destroyed by this. Right. Oh, yeah. So there's no evidence that anything happened other than the children and their claims. But there's also no physical damage to the children. Hmm. If you had a axe handle put up your butt, there would be some kind of, Physical damage. If you were cut, there would be physical damage. If you were put in a cage or put in a freezer, there'd be something to say it happened to you. But to this day, all the children say these events, these tortures, this still happen to them, even though now they're 10 years older. So there's some theories as to what have ha- what happened here at the, the Martinsville Nightmare. Uh, I have one that I heard on CBC, but what do you think happened? Oh, this is, sorry, this is true crime though, right? This, this is, is not... Yeah. This is not anything paranormal. It's true crime. Yeah, because it actually happened and people were charged. Yeah. Okay. But you're saying paranormal is real stuff, man, you know? Okay. <laughs> then it's vampires. <laughs> okay. okay. Sure. There is a group of vampires in Martinsville. Mm-hmm. And they, uh, they hypnotized people to do their dirty work. And then they, because uh, vampires can do that. And no, that's not it. Vampires, though. Okay. That would be crazy. No. I guess the question is, how can the children say these crimes happened when there's no evidence that they actually happened? That is so weird. Yeah. That is that is so difficult because, I mean, let's say there's five kids. Yeah. And was it the five kids each said there were cages, there were freezers, there was a bed? Or was it this kid said, oh, I was put in a cage. Oh, I was put in a freezer. Oh, there was a bed that I, a water bed I was on. Was it that, or do we know? We don't know, but I think it was similar across all the stories. Okay. And okay. just for record, there was thirty kids. That is a lot of kids. Yeah. And sorry, how old were they? There was daycare, so I'm assuming from like two to seven. Okay. So the theory here is that it didn't happen. Okay. That, according to psychologists, mm. it's easier to make someone believe something that didn't happen happened because there's nothing in their mind to say that's wrong right so like 
I could say, remember that time you got hit by that car last week? Mm -hmm. You're saying that didn't happen. But then you think, well, did it happen? Was there a date, a time last week I got hit by a car? And maybe you just don't remember it because you were hit by a car. So that's the theory is that these ideas were planted in their head by their parents. Because mm. they asked, the police asked the parents first. I see. I see. Because, okay, that makes total sense. Okay, so what you just said was kind of what I was thinking, but I didn't know how to word it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you worded it because I could, there is probably stories in my past that maybe I embellished, maybe someone else embellished, mm -hmm. or someone told me. And I, so like, let's say you, you were like, like you said, do you remember when you got hit by that car? And I'm like, dude, I don't even remember that. But then two years later, maybe you go, remember when you got hit with the car? Oh, I think I do remember that. Yeah. Not thinking that I'm just remembering the time you told me that yes. I got hit by a car. Then the third time, you could be like, hey, remember when you got hit by the car? Yeah, dude, that hurt. <laughs> yes, exactly. I get that. Yeah, that makes total sense. The other day, I was talking to my mom about uh, my old friend, Stephen, and how we were in elementary school. We got our shoes mixed up, and I wore his shoes home, and he wore my shoes home. Right. I don't remember that, but now I remember that because my mom told me about right. it. Did it happen? I don't know. I'll have to go ask Stephen. He probably won't remember it either because that was like 20 years ago. But apparently it happened. Mm. So when the police asked the parents if anything happened, and then they asked the kids, well, now the kids are thinking, did something happen? Mm -hmm. And then as they push the kids more, ask maybe leading questions, did anyone touch you? Who was there? Were the police there? Anything, like anything that would kind of add to the story. Plus you got a child's imagination. Yes. Yes. The other kind of side of it comes from uh, Constable Claudia. She had just came back from a forum in the United States talking about satanic sex, sex rituals in the 1980s in the United States and how this same thing happened throughout the United States where there was a daycare and there was kids saying they were being assaulted and an investigation and no one was found guilty because there was no evidence. Mm. This happened, I think it said about 50 times in the United States. So... This was a big thing in the States and finally came up to Canada from someone who'd gone to a conference in the States. Interesting. Okay. So it was a mentality she had had going into the investigation, plus the, the parents leading into the questions that made this whole idea of sexual assault by satanic ritual in the, in the, <sighs> the daycare. So, or it happened and we're totally missing something. That, that was what I was thinking. So like, <laughs> it's either psychology right. run rampant, right? Mm -hmm. And no one stopped it when they should have. Or it is a satanic sex cult that is just really good at hiding things as a, a satanic sex cult would be. Or vampires. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Because if are you big into conspiracy theories in the United States? Uh, I'll listen to them. Okay. Well, that's fair. It's best not to think too much about them. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a lot of friends that uh, tell me them over and over again. And I go, mm hmm, cool. Well, I'm sure you've heard of Pizzagate then, right? Pizzagate, yeah. The basement of the... Of the pizza place. Yeah. So the pizza gate, where they had these uh, sex offenders in the basement of the, of the pizza place in New York, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And they investigated and there's nothing. Right. The idea is, is that the sex, the satanic sex group, the Satanists are part of the police. They're part of the government. And when the government shut down this investigation in Martinsville, it was similar. Because mm. they wanted to shut this thing down before it went any further. Right. So although there is no crime, there's no evidence... And the victims will say it happened. The idea is that Satanists had shut it down, that they were behind the whole thing and they closed it down before it went any further. Mm. So a lot of people still think, like my mom, that something messed up happened in Martinsville. Right. Because it doesn't just end like that. So do you think it was a satanic sex cult behind the whole thing or do you think it was just psychology? Uh, if I had to put a percentage on it, I would say 75% of my brain thinks it's psychology. Yeah, I'm leaning that way too. Yeah. Because it seems like people always want to blame the unknown, mm. blame the Satanists, or blame blame the witches, right. or blame something else than just people. 25% of my brain isn't set on the Satanist part of it. It's mm -hmm. just that 75% of it is psychology mm -hmm. in my head, mm -hmm. and 25% of it is a chance of it not being psychology. You know what I mean? Mm, like, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not holding on to the Satan. Satanists. Yeah, because well, like uh, I looked into Satanism a long time ago. Just mm. curious, what is this thing, right, that everyone's all worked up about? And their whole thing is not Satan. It's like a ruse on Christianity. It's mm. like we believe in ourselves and being good and being kind to ourselves 
Right. Like, you can be a good person without believing in God. That's the whole idea. Oh, they have something. They don't. They have something similar to the Ten Commandments, and they're not even that bad. Yeah. It's yeah. like uh, be wary of psychic vampires. I think is one of them. Yeah. Which again, vampires. Like I'm just saying. And they have a whole thing that if you believe in Satan, go get help. We're not about that in Satanism. Right. From what I know about Satanism, they don't do that stuff. Mm. The the crazy people do. Yeah. Who might operate under that same umbrella, but it's not what what Satanists do. Mm. So I do think it is psychology. That's what I'm going 100% on psychology. Some people who were involved may be listening, mm. right? Um, and some of them, it's tough. They're still out. They're still living. It's not like the pastors we've had there. Everyone's dead and gone. These people are still suffering with whatever happened in Martinsville. Well, if everyone just is, has a good as good attention span as me, then they'll forget about it soon. <laughs> like the time you got hit by that car? Yeah, that did happen, didn't it? <laughs> that hurt. <laughs> Thank you for sitting with me and hearing this horrible story. <laughs> oh, I'd love to hear horrible stories. They, they they, brighten my day. This was a true crime episode of Unsolved Canadian Mysteries. Mm. It was a dark one. Dark, very dark. Very dark. Hopefully the next one will be a true crime, but a little bit lighter. Yeah, a little less um, children heavy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll fix something a little bit better. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the next one's like, in this story... 524 children were murdered. <laughs> Maybe we'll do one in Regina next time because we picked on Saskatoon last time. Yeah. I'll find Ooh. one. In Regina? Yeah, we'll do something in Regina, sure. <sighs> no, no, I promised it'd be Regina, so I have to... Yeah, I have, no, you have to I have to do it now. present. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kenton. Well, thank you, Dylan. This was a blast. And thanks to everyone for listening and supporting us. You can follow us on uh, Twitter and uh Instagram and Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcasts, you can find us. Anywhere. And we will see you guys next time.